I'm Katherine Ambrose, and this is Empowered Senior. Thank you for being here. We are a 501c3 charitable organization, and we're able to put on our programming thanks to the educational sponsors, the companies that are in this room. We could not do it without them. It's a very expensive event to put on, and there's a lot of expenses every day of the month to be able to accomplish this. This seminar was so popular five years ago when we started, it launched a television show that is on PBS Kansas. And it has become, it was a monthly show the first year, now it's a weekly show. And we are very busy in production producing a lot of TV right now that will be airing soon. We have a sister show now, Ageless Enthusiasm. Mindy, you wanna stand up? And Ageless Enthusiasm is on next week. Thursday. At what time? Is it 8 o'clock? Right? Th 8 o'clock. All right. So we're going to try our little trick that we learned last month. You ready? One, two, three. Shh. Something great to work on your, with your grandchildren. Okay. Ready? We're going to do it one more time. One, two, three. Shh. Miss Jillian realtor with Ambrose team, our family real estate practice. We specialize in helping seniors. If you still need a binder, just raise your hand and she will bring one to you. I didn't bring very many. We're missing my husband today. He's fishing in the Gulf of Mexico with our son. And um, so I didn't bring as much stuff as I normally bring. Last month we had Elvis here and a lot of us danced did the best to entertain everyone. We had a fashion show that was so colorful. I really loved it. And our topic was on fun. We haven't done that topic before. It was on how to have more fun in your life, how to make your life as interesting as possible. And that's the theme we want to continue to carry on. Today we have a serious topic, but we're still going to have fun. And if you think you know everything about caregiving or communicating with your family, or you've just got communication down, period, I bet you're going to learn something today, and I'd like to know what it is. So I'm going to ask you to help me by writing down what you learned unexpectedly today. Sometimes people will come up to me and say, I just didn't know if this topic was going to be something that would apply to me. But oh my gosh, I'm so glad I was here. And so if you have some of those ahas, like, I didn't know about this topic, but I came anyway, write down what struck you and what value you got out of this. We have a guest that came here from Denver, Colorado to share information. It's going to be very interesting. We have another author. I love to present off authors. And if you have a favorite author that's coming into town, let me know. Maybe we can interview them for TV or have them do a workshop with us or come to our seminar. So um, we're going to learn a lot about how to communicate better with the people that matter the most to us. So I think that we're going to really have some good things to discuss. So I'm America's senior home coach where my 100% passion for the rest of my life is helping seniors figure out, navigate all of the challenges that come with aging. It's very complex, it's very overwhelming, you know that, and we are working to bring in the best professionals locally and beyond to educate ourselves, and I'm learning right along with you. My personal focus is home and lifestyle and general just quality of life. And with Mindy doing Ageless Enthusiasm, that's kind of designed for your kids, where we talk to them about, oh, cosmetic surgery, and hair loss, male pattern hair loss, intimacy issues. Redefining life, health, and happiness. Redefining life, health, and happiness. But we woo them with topics we know they're interested in, and then we weave in the topics that we need them to be interested in. And um, so that's what, what we're doing with that show. Our education partners that support us and make this possible, I hope you'll thank them for doing this for us. Some of them are missing today because they're at the Alzheimer's conference. 
Wichita has the third largest Alzheimer's conference in the country. And so lots of professionals go there um, to learn, um, and I think consumers as well. But there's a lot of people working that event today. But Blue Stem Communities in Heston, Newton, they have adult daycare in Hutchinson. I know they're working on some other things that they'll be unveiling soon. American Senior Benefits has been with us since the beginning. Oxford Senior Living, I saw them here today. The Regent, is anyone here from the Regent today? Okay, I think there must be at the conference. Cedric Plaza, Providence, Catholic Adult Day Services, the Catholic Diocese has been very supportive of everything we do. Morris Lang Law Firm, thank you. It's just amazing to have attorneys in the room. Can you believe that, that the attorneys come and serve you coffee and answer your questions? It's amazing. Thank you, guys. Um, and the Fleece and Gooing, who brought the coffee, can, let's give them a round of applause. They really like it. And Humana, Greg Dane. Greg, give us a wave. One of our favorite speakers, and he talks about longevity, so that's always fascinating. Th these are the people that support the TV show, American Senior Plaza, uh, Benefits, Cedric Plaza, Fleece and Gooing, and Blue Stem. And then the companies that support the seminars right there. Okay. Working on the clicker. All right. Do we have veterans in the room? If you'd like to be recognized, please stand so we can thank you for the privilege that we have of living in this amazing com country. And if you'd like to make your room your way up to the front of the room, maybe you could lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And everyone, please stand. We're living in interesting times, like everyone ever in history. But definitely, we're living in interesting times. And no matter what, we're so privileged and lucky to be here in the United States. Thank you for your service, father and daughter. Nope. Well, how about that? I thought this whole time that it was father and daughter. All right. But you look after him so much and come together as a team. That's fantastic. All right. Well, thank you, Ann and Floyd. Amen. Thank you. I want to thank the senior ambassadors, the attendees that have become raving fans and they're so charitable with their time and their enthusiasm. They're helping us at the registration tables. They're getting flyers around town. Thank you so much. If you're senior ambassador, would you please stand so we can recognize the hard work that you're doing and the enthusiasm you bring. Thank you very much. And mother, M mom drives flyers all over town and Doug gets dragged with her a lot of the time, I think. So, oh, Aunt Carolyn is here, hi. Okay, all right, this is what we do as Empowered Senior and also my family. We do in-home consults, we do phone consults. I can talk to anyone anywhere in the country about whatever issues they have. Uh, going on in their life related to aging. Those conversations are very helpful. There's no cost for those consultations. In-home consults are my favorite thing to do, to talk about any topic that we cover in the seminars or on the TV show. But certainly things specifically related to your house and how you can age better in place or where you might want to go at some point. I do downsize coaching. Our team does senior move management. We're certified, insured. We take everything very seriously that we do. Of course, we do the education and the PBS television show. My family does real estate, and then Brian Spear on my board of directors and myself, we do placement. We help people figure out all their senior living options, and that's gonna be a big part of the conversation today. Downsizers Club. We are going to do Downsizers Club at least through the end of the year. The people that come to Downsizers Club love it. They say it's very helpful. It's a small group. 
This is for anyone that is living in a home that they feel they might need to minimize items in their house and just simplify their home. Or if they're, they're thinking about making a downsize move, maybe immediately or maybe way in the future, only if they have to. Downsizers Club is for you. We've simplified our schedule so that Downsizers Club is now on Tuesday at the television station before the seminar. So it's the Tuesday before the Thursday seminar. All right, there's our ambassadors. They would very much like to talk to you about how you can be an ambassador and do more fun things together as a group. They are gathering information from all over the city about fun things you can do, and they're bringing that into our nonprofit network so we can share that information with you so that you'll never be bored and your life is as fun and as interesting as it possibly can be. All right, let's get started with our program. Please welcome Cameron Crawford. She is the president of the Colorado Placement and Referral Alliance. They have gotten very important legislation through the first state to do what they're doing, and this needs to happen in every single state. She's going to talk to you about family choice and about having fiduciaries and um, people that are looking out for your best interest when it comes to figuring out where to go for senior living. She's the owner of Next Step Senior Placement, and she has a lot to share. Cameron, come on up. Hello. Um, I've been to Wichita one time in my life. We were on a road trip, and my kids decided that we should drive three and a half hours out of the way to come get Shocker t-shirts. <laughs> so now I've been here twice, and I'm just having the best time. This is amazing, beautiful. So thank you so much for letting me be here. Um, since I don't know a lot about y'all, I wanted to see what we have in common. So we're going to play a little game here. Hang on. Let's see if I can work technology. Uh, this one? Hello. That's me. It worked. Um, okay. Can we play a game? All right. Everybody put your hand up. I'm going to ask some questions. And if that, what I ask, fits you, I want you to raise your hand. First question. I thought we'd start off easy. Are you alive and breathing? Good. All right. We all have something in common. Have you ever eaten at White Castle? I heard there's not a White Castle here anymore. That's a little sad for me. So I, maybe I should have said Pizza Hut. But do you have a pet that brings you joy? So important. And that's going to be important when I talk about finding different places to live. If a pet is important to you, that's something that needs to be on your list. I need to have my pet with me. Have you ever owned a Harley? I knew it. You did? You're so cool. Yeah. So I didn't. I'm not nearly as cool. Have you ever, did you ever sneak out of your house as a teenager? This is a safe place. You can be honest. I'll hook y'all up with my teenage daughter. You can. <laughs> Lived in another country? Ever skied in Colorado? Oh, you guys are my people. Thank you. Have you ever run a marathon? Yeah. Okay, somebody in the back. Anybody else? Uh, in the corner. Where? Oh, oh. Oh, well, I mean, she could run a marathon right now, so. <laughs> were you ever in a movie? Joyce, what movie were you in? That is fabulous. And who else raised their hand? She was in Sarah Plain and Ta Tall. Skylark, in another one. You can get her autograph later. Rob, the dinosaur man, has been in a movie. Rob, what movie were you in? H.P. Lion, Roger the Sky. Awesome. Really? Wow. The Bernadette Peter. Did you have a thing with Bernadette Peters? Let's just be honest here. 
now. <laughs> we happen to have a very accomplished, uh, I would say, movie star, since we're in Wichita, Delno, who's taking the photos. Delno, what movies have you been in? Just rattle them off like it's a script. What movies have you been in? Uh, Ambrose Beer Civil War Stories, Wichita, um, Death Alley, uh, Love, Courage, and the Battle of Bushy Run, which is set to come out sometime this year. Getting ready to shoot Sod and Stubble. Wow. For Ken Spurgeon in July and was in uh, the Contested Plains last year with Mo Brings Plenty and Mary McDonough. So. That's just like the recent things, because there's a whole bunch. What Disney movie? The Haunted Mansion. The Haunted Mansion. See, wow. like I'm telling you, like he's super cool. The original Haunted Mansion, not the one with Eddie Murphy, not the one coming out later on this year. <laughs> That's just a small little taste of what movies he's been in. Okay, continue, Cameron. Fun question. I've never been in a movie, so. Um, have you ever had a pet skunk? I knew. I, every time I asked this, someone's had a pet skunk or a pet raccoon. I had a raccoon. Loved a fish. Rode a horse to school. Oh, somebody in the back. Two back there. Uh, won the Denver Nuggets to win the NBA championship. Woo, woo, woo. Oh, uh, every hand should be up on that. Owned a T-bird. Yes. That's my goal. You were you in a band? We have a lot Lots of band of people. people. <laughs> Lots of people. Served in the military. Thank you for your service. Are a caregiver for a family member or a friend? That one went really fast. Are a caregiver? One out of five adults are. So that's a lot of, if you're at a table with five people, one of y'all is probably a caregiver or will be a caregiver. Um, ever beat up a bully? Yeah. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Been to a Garth Brooks concert? Yay. Yep. Oh, owned your own business? In a book club? Book club, anyone? Oh, thank you. We have similar hearts. You've done like everything, Rob. Uh, have more than 20 grandkids? Woo! And thank you for your service. Uh, have seen the Northern Stars? Dude, do you do every? Who are you people? You have exciting lives. Won a prize at the State Fair? That's one of my goals. Have a tattoo? Yes, thank you. My daughter's trying to talk me into that one. Can milk a cow? Impressive. Worked for the IRS. I have questions for you afterwards. <laughs> have been to the Eiffel Tower? I love this. You guys are so cool. Have eaten mountain oysters? The fact that this many people even know what that is. It goes with the milk a cow thing. Know how to play mahjong? Or a teacher? Love to have coffee in the morning? Have been to all 50 states? Oh my gosh, oh, that's so fun. And love someone with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's? Yeah, me too. I'm in there with you. All right, this is my mom. She's who I love with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. When my mom was 66, which is way too young, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. For my family, it was devastating and it was shocking. And for those of y'all that have been through that, first of all, a lot of denial. It couldn't be my mom. She's the most put together person in the world. She's almost as cool as Rob. Um, and my whole family was very focused I, we were a very mom-centered family. It was all about my mom. And so to have our matriarch get sick um, turned our world upside down. And we really, at that time, she was so mild. We had no idea 
what the whole thing would look like. We kind of thought she would tell the same stories all over, you know, over and over, or she'd forget things. We had no idea what Alzheimer's would look like. Um, as her daughter, and if you have a daughter, a lot of times they are the ones that step into that caregiving role at whatever capacity um, it is. Um, I was devastated. I went to all our doctor's appointments, and I cried literally for four years. I would cry, you know, I did all her shopping because as this beautiful Texas queen, she told me, she looked at me and she said, just make sure I look good. And I'm like, I got you, mom, I'm there for you. Um, and I was in J. Jill buying her pants that had like an elastic waist, uh, they easy to get up. And the lady looked at me and she's like, why are you buying these? These don't seem like your age or your style. And I burst out in tears in the middle of the mall and I just, you know, broke down and for the sales lady. She took me to the back. Her mom had had Alzheimer's. And I sat there and cried. And I realized we all need somebody that understands what we're going through. Because a lot of times, if you have not been a caregiver in a difficult situation, it's, most people do not understand what you're going through. So it's, um, it's good to have your people. It's good to have your tribe. So I cried for four years. And then um, I decided to do something productive with my grief, and I started a placement company. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about why this is my passion, what they know, the people, uh, a placement agent, what a placement agent can do for you, and then we're going to do a little Q&A. Okay, the first thing I did when my mom, we, she was at home for a very long time and doing very well, and uh, all of a sudden she had a big decline. So the first thing that I did was I called an online resource that I'd heard on the radio. And um, I called them, and the person answered the phone. They were nice. And then they referred me to a place five minutes from my house for a memory care that I knew had a bad reputation because I'm a researcher. And I said, huh, why are you telling me to go there? They have a horrible reputation. And the guy said, well, I don't know. I've never been there. And I'm like, I said, well, where do you live? And he lived in California. And I'm like, have you even been to my hometown? And he's like, no. And I'm like, all right. So he sent me a list of places. Um, and then he kept calling me constantly. As soon as I hung up my phone, he had, like, they call it spray and pray. He had sent my name out to 20 different communities who are obligated to start calling you within five to 10 minutes. And so it was like being sold a used truck. Everybody's calling me, hey, we hear, and um, I was so offended by the whole process that somebody would spray my name and my personal information out and that they would refer me to places that had bad reputations that um, I decided I wanted to do something um, instead and started my own group to treat people the way they should be treated. What I didn't realize is that when I called them and I agreed to work, to talk with somebody, is that I had entered into a contract with them. And the contract is for life. So um, I know, I, it, isn't that bizarre? Now, some legislation has changed that too, that they can only own your name for three years. But when I called them at the time, it was about 2018, it entered me into a lifetime contract. So much so that when I went back to a community four years later, as a business person, I was bringing a client there. I walked in and the salesperson looked at me and said, Cameron, how's your mom? And I'm like, it's kind of creepy. I'm like, what, how do you know about my mom? And they said, well, is your mom still looking for a place? And I'm like, oh, that, that just feels wrong. So um, a lot of what we'll talk about is there's national groups that advertise a lot. And they make a lot of money off of spraying your name out to places. But there's local people that do it also, that do a much better job and an are in and out of these places all the time and can help you out. What I wanted, what I wanted is to find a person that could communicate with me and help me help communicate with um, the decision makers in our family. What I wanted was somebody that knows the communities in the area. 
here in town, I think y'all have 70 different assisted livings, which seems like a lot. In Denver, we have over 450. And all of them have little niches. I never say one's bad all the time, because something can always be a fit in a certain situation, but it's good to know the details of them. I want somebody to help navigate the process, because I didn't think it was a big deal. You just go to a place, you look it up, you sign it up. There's a lot of details that are important to know about that you don't know if you've never done it before. And I wanted something that didn't cost me anything because I'm cheap. That's just the way I am. Y'all might like to spend a lot of money, but most of the people that do placement should not charge you for that fee. And the reason why is they will have contracts with all the communities and they get a referral fee from them. Now sometimes people are like, well, I don't want to work with them because they're going to get a referral fee. It's true, but it, I work, as I tell my clients, I work with over 350 places in Denver. My job isn't to find who will pay me or who will work with me because most people I have a contract with. My job is to find what fits your family and your family's unique care needs, and it should always be about you. It should be about you and your loved one and your family. What do we look for? Usually, if somebody's helping you find a place, they have three main targets. They're going to look at what your care needs are, they're going to look at your budget, and they're going to look at your location. Now, the first two are non-negotiables. You have to go to a place that can meet your care needs. And if some place is called a memory care, it doesn't always meet, they, they can meet all memory care people's needs. If somebody has more difficult needs, then you need a specialized memory care that is able to actually handle those needs. Um, budget, you can't give on budget. And I talk to too many people that choose something because it's an emergency, and then they find out later on that they can't afford it. And then location, you can give a little bit in on, but those are the two that you need. Ooh, what can they do for your families? Well, that didn't turn out well. Uh, the placement agent should make phone calls. They should set up tours for you. They should meet you at the tours at the communities and go with you. And then they are your therapy. They should be like your favorite daughter or your best friend to g talk through what it looks like to find a place, all the emotions that go with that. And then they should follow through. There's a lot of paperwork, a lot of information that needs to come from your physician, and they should help you through the whole process if you're looking for a senior living. What else should you look for? A placement agent is somebody like me that would meet with you, talk about what your needs are, and then they can help you find what fits for you. And these are all things that have been important to different clients of mine. When I meet with them, I'm like, tell me your three things that are most important to you. Well, one person, it was aluminum pans. So every place we went, we had to ask them what kind of pans they had. Um, if they have a pet, if they smoke, if they have a spin down, which is a spin down to Medicaid, so that goes back to the budget piece, are you going to need to be going on to Medicaid in the future? There are places where you can go that are nicer that can help you plan for that in the future. Um, do they have vision problems? Is food the most important thing? Do they need Spanish speakers? Do they wander? Do they have challenging behaviors? Do they have a prolapse rectum? I didn't even know what that was. But it's a thing. And there is only one place in Denver that will take somebody with that. So really unique needs that you might not even know um, are important. You need to find a place that can actually meet those needs. Or what are you paying your money for? It's a waste of your money and it's not giving you the care that you need. And the placement agent should go and find all of these things to fit those needs. What about the communities? The communities, the placement agent should know if they offer transportation, um, what the turnover is, do they have staff that turns over all the time, what's their reputation, what's their care history, what's their size, what's the um, ombudsman complaints. The ombudsman is the government entity that if you have an issue at a senior living, you call the ombudsman and a room size. So they should know all the details and then tell you the ones that fit for you. Um, here in Wichita, um, Brian Spear and Catherine Ambrose both help with placement. And that's it. So first, what I want to say is, 
If you are a family caregiver, you're right up there with the vets and you're right up there with the teachers because it is a hard job. I know you love your person, but at times you can get worn out and tired. And if you are keeping them at home, I want to applaud you because that is extra, that is really hard. It's a lot of your time, but the reward because you love this person and you are caring for them is amazing. Sometimes it doesn't work at home anymore. I always vote, if you can keep somebody at home, I, am, I support you 100%. And there are home care companies and home health companies to support you in doing that. But at some times, especially if there's more difficult behaviors or higher care needs, you just can't do it anymore. And there's so much guilt, there's so much pain in making that decision because you're getting torn in all different directions. And honestly, if you are um, a spouse, a lot of times there were conversations 10, 15 years ago that I will never make you move. And sometimes when the reality comes, there are times where you just didn't realize what this was going to look like, and it's not working anymore. And so if you are going to be in that situation, you need to make a move, then it really helps to have somebody walk beside you. Now, if you're independent and you want to play mahjong and be in a book club and ride a Harley and you just want to go for the food, the socialization, that's super fun. And there are places like that, too, that they will fit your personality and you can be having the best time of your life. And it, um, it's a really great way to work with somebody else to either work with you if you're working with something that's heartbreaking and hard or if you want something that just gives you more socialization. So... That's my um, time to open up for questions and answers. What questions? Oh, wait, wrong one. Questions? I have a question. How about continuum of care? Because we've had a lot of downsizing people that are in this room that made decisions for their own continuum of care. Could you explain what that means and why that's an important factor in planning your future? Thank you. Um, so a lot of times there's, there's some communities that just meet kind of a niche need, like they are only independent living or they only do assisted living. And there's some places that have the continuum of care where you have independent living, assisted living, and memory care. Um, and those can be really great for couples if a couple is aging differently. And so one person needs to be on one level and the other person can be in the other, you know, one person's independent and one person has more care needs. They can be on the same building. Um, they can, uh, it just, it looks different for uh, each one. Sometimes that is a really great fit because you can move in and then hopefully you will be able to age in place there no matter what happens. Um, sometimes... So people always say that's what they want to start off. But at the same time, if you are super independent and really all you need to do to be successful is maybe you need meals and transportation and other people around, then sometimes a standalone independent living might fit better for you. Um, so it just kind of depends. And I recommend always checking out both because you don't know until you go. I say it's like Goldilocks. You go into one that's too big, one's too small, then you find the one that's just right. So it's kind of nice to look at both because some of them, like a standalone memory care, might specialize in memory care, but it's not attached to a bigger building. So it just depends on what your budget is, what your family's looking for, and your personality. Very good. Well, I already learned something. Jillian, where are you? She's out in the lobby. So I already learned that she snuck out <laughs> as a teenager. I did not know that. What did you guys learn? Did you learn anything yet? Carolyn, did you ever sneak out of my grandparents' house? You never did. I was a boring child. I don't think, I don't remember you being boring. You were a hippie. Well, that was college. That was college. Oh, high school, I was, high school, I was a good girl. Barbara, did you ever sneak out of my grandparents' house? No, just snuck out with their charge cards for shopping. Well, they gave them to you, so she's always been a clothes horse. Oh, I did, yes. They figured that out. So my 
Brownie and Girl Scout leaders here, could you please stand? She taught me how to make Barbie cups and all kinds of amazing things, and I just love you. And she was our Brownie and Girl Scout leader because this was my girlfriend, Joan, growing up. Did you ever sneak out? I did not. I no. knew it because no. <laughs> she was good. I knew it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and she didn't, her kids didn't either, as far as she knows. <laughs> as far as she knows. All right, let's bring up our next speaker, and we're going to talk about all these things, so it might help spur some questions, because we really do have an expert here, and I've got a lot of questions for her to address. And so after Mark speaks, we'll put both of them in the hot seats, and if you don't ask them questions, I will. After every session, people come up and say, well, I do have a question or a comment, and then they'll share it with me, and I think, oh, I wish you would have said that on the microphone, or just whisper it to us, because it helps other people when you share your question or your ha-ha, because that helps other people make a connection. So, all right, now we're going to talk about communication, because it goes hand in hand, because when you're making a downsizing move, or when you're making caregiving decisions, or you're planning your future, there's a lot of candid, emotional conversations that need to take place. And who has perfect family relationships where everybody gets along? Everybody gets along. Anybody? No. Okay, well. <laughs> who struggles just in their own brain? You don't really get along with yourself sometimes. Okay, so there's a lot of conflict involved when it comes to making any of these decisions. One day you're thinking this, or one minute you're thinking this, and then you're thinking that. Then you might have a spouse to talk these things through, or a sister, son, daughter, lots of conflict. And then there's unresolved conflict maybe from other things. So Mark, would you please fix all that for us? And do it in 15 minutes. Thank you, Catherine. I got it right here. Thank you so much. I've recently just gotten to know Catherine, and I really like her. <laughs> and I really appreciate her, and I uh, appreciate all that I've learned from you already. And Cameron, I really appreciate everything you had to share. I'm in a situation where both my parents are in the mid-80s, early 90s, and my wife is in a similar situation. And to know that there are people out there like the two of you who can really help us. It's like, I'm really encouraged. So thank you for what you do, both of you. I just want to say thank you. Thank you. And but Yeah, OK. And for Botanica, wow, this is amazing. Here, this is just incredible. So a big thank you for, uh, uh, to Botanica. And then I want to say thank you to each one of you for being here for sitting the way you are in such great postures listening. <laughs> and one of my life, one of my values in life is to be a lifelong learner. And I believe you being here is indicative of you being the same, that you also want to be a lifelong learner. And I think that's wonderful. So good job for being here. Now, I do want to thank you for testing, testing. Is that a little better? Okay. Is that better? Awesome. Do I have to start over? Yeah, if you can't hear, just, uh, just stand up and jump or something to let me know. That's great. I just wanted to tell you one other thing that I'm really thankful for, and I'm thankful for great listeners. I have a little secret to tell you. Most speakers, even though they've spoken many times, whenever they get up, they still have a little bit of anxiety. Because is this going to go as well as they hoped? So I want to show you as a listener how you can help all speakers, including me. And that's to be a good listener. Well, here's one way that you can indicate that you're a good listener. I call it head bobbing. It's like this. So
So let's all try head bobbing together right now. Let's all try some head bobbing. Ren, one, two, three. Let me see your head bobbing. What is your name? Carolyn. I was amazed with Carolyn's head bobbing. <laughs> there was two things about it. She responded but immediately, but there was a sincerity in her head bobbing. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. And I'm glad you're at the front up here because you're going to be encouraging me throughout, I can tell. All right. Well, my name is Mark. I'm a marriage and family counselor and author and creator of Pledge Talk and the Pledge of a Lifetime. We'll talk about it a little more as we go along. Again, my name is Mark. Everybody say, hello, Mark. That's good. I always feel, I feel like we're friends already. And I am passionate about helping people learn to communicate and connect. It came out of 35 years of marriage counseling, where four out of five people come to me and say, we can't communicate. We just can't communicate. And I would say to them, okay, okay, start right now talking through a problem and let me see. And I would just kind of watch them. And literally within two minutes in my head, I'm thinking, they're right. They can't communicate. It's terrible. And no wonder they're having the difficulties that they are. Well, communication and connection is really, really important. And it's because of what I experienced over and over and again with all the couples that I worked with, I developed Pledge Talk. It's a how-to because communication really matters. So take a moment. I want you to think through your head, and your, come up with those people in your life right now that matter most to you. Take five seconds and see if you can name the people in your head of those people who matter most right now to you. I hope you came up with at least a good handful. And I did that for two reasons. Again, those people are the people who matter most, and the relational connections you have with them matter. And the older we get, the more they matter. And I want you to keep those people in mind. As I teach the six steps of pledge in just a moment, those people will provide motivation, that's my hope, Motivation for you to learn what I'm about to teach you. Now, connection is really important, and learning pledge is really important for connection, but I have a challenge before me. I usually take about 60 to 90 minutes to teach this, and I think I have six minutes and 39 seconds left. So, you're going to have to lean forward in your chair, not too far forward, but lean forward, make sure the head bobbing is, is, is prepared, and, and listen well as we go through this process. I'm going to go through all six steps, and then I'm going to focus on the top two just for today. Again, this is six steps that if you learn this well, it's going to help all of your relationships. Doesn't matter what age, I have a, a, a daughter who's a kindergarten teacher, and she's taught this to five-year-olds and watched how they used it for their relationships and worked through conflicts. Because that's the other thing we're going to learn. How to use this in a sequence, like it's on, the, on the, the PowerPoint slide there, to use it in that sequence, it will help you to resolve conflict. Okay, here we go. Really quick. Are you listening? Good. All right. Got some. Oh, your head bobber there. I, I saw that as well. Awesome. Here we go. So what I want to suggest is the next time you're in a conflict, and you recognize it, somebody just hit the pause button. Hit the pause button and get quiet to dial down your emotions. Then go on to the next step, which is volunteer to listen and say, I will listen first to your side of the story about what went down. Now, somebody has to do that because somebody has to listen, volunteer to listen first. 
I've been around a lot of people where they're both trying to talk at the same time. I don't know if you've ever seen that or not, but it doesn't really work. Not if you want to have a healthy, good conversation. So volunteer to listen first, but listen to understand. Then once you think you understand them, echo back to clarify and make sure you did hear them properly. If you did, then you disarm the tension between you by validating their story, validating their thoughts, saying, I understand. It makes sense why you were frustrated the way you were. And then, only after you've done those first four things, you've paused, listened, echoed, and disarmed the tension by validating, can you then say, can I give you my perspective of what happened? And then you can ask them to listen, to echo, and to validate your thoughts as well. And the last step is to engage this process around and around so that you, 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 you resolve the conflict and, it, and you deepen the relational connection. Okay, think with me again. Think of the last time you were in conversation with someone and you found yourself just reacting or you saw someone else reacting. Can you remember that time? I can remember, honey, my wife's sitting over there about two days ago. I think I did this with you. I remember. And it didn't go really well until I recognized what was happening and I remembered, ah, oh, I need to pause. I tell the couples that I work with, I say, I've been married 41 and a half years to that woman over there, and it's amazing. But we still have conflict. Can you believe that? No, you can't believe it. Well, we still do. Here's the difference. When we have conflict, we know what to do. And I am like, literally, I said this the other day, and I don't know if you remember me saying this, but I said this in another talk that I gave, that I am literally like, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I'm literally like 100% confident that when my wife and I are in conflict, we're going to be able to talk it through because we understand pledge. Not only the six steps, but we understand the heart behind it. Pledge, you see, is an acronym, and I love the word pledge because it reminds me of how I'm committed to relationships. I made a pledge to my wife that I would love her until we die. I've done, I've pledged to my children that I would love them. In my mind and heart, I have this pledge to love my neighbor. And so, remembering that pledge and the stick steps helps me to resolve conflict when I realize we're in it. So, Here's what I want to suggest. We'll go to the first two steps now. Here's what I want to suggest. Tonight or tomorrow or this weekend, when you find yourself in conflict with someone, I mean, it's going to happen. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be yelling, screaming. That might happen, but it might be you might just see somebody's eyes roll. <laughs> or you just hear a little bit of tone. You know the tone thing? Somebody over here knows the tone thing. Or somebody just says, you always do that. What I want to suggest is when those kind of things happen, you're in conflict. And what I want to suggest is just simply do this. Say, hold on a second. Can we just pause? Can we just pause a moment? Here's why. I realized I was reacting or I was about to react, and I don't want to do that because... You matter to me. And this relationship matters to me. Can we just pause a few moments so we can dial down our emotions and begin to think straight once again? There's a PET scan, interestingly enough, that says when our emotions are real high, the rational part of the brain shuts down. So we literally need to pause, dial down, so we can think straight again. The other thing we can do is, when I'm pausing and dialing down my emotions and taking some good breaths, I'm reminding myself, this is my wife, I love her, this is my son, I think the world of him, this is my neighbor, 
I want to make sure we continue to be good neighbors. I remind myself of that. Then once we do that, then we come back to listening. Listening, though, to understand. So if I'm in a conflict, um, Paul, if I was in a conflict with you, right, and I was going to sit down and say, okay, Paul, let's talk this through, I would do that. And I would say, I'm going to volunteer to listen first, okay, because you were mad about something for some reason, and then I would say, I need to understand from your perspective what was going on, okay? Here's the problem with listening. We all tend to be listeners, but we're usually listening for the wrong thing. The tendency is this. If I was just to do it naturally without thinking, I'd be listening to Paul kind of like this. <laughs> Whether I'm doing that literally with my face or not, inside that's what's going on. And what's happening is I'm listening to see everything that Paul says that's wrong. Now, that's not true. In my head, I'm going, that's not true. And that's, I didn't do that. It wasn't Tuesday. It was Thursday last week. No, 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 no. I'm listening to all those things that are wrong. And then as soon as he takes a breath, I'm in. And I'm in telling him everything that he's just got wrong. But the problem is this. Now he's listening to me, and he's listening to me in the same way. He's listening to me to find out everything that I just said that was wrong. And as soon as I take a breath, he's in, and the conflict is on. What we need to be doing instead is I need to be listening to understand Paul. Paul is frustrated for some reason, or he rolled his eyes or got quiet for some reason. I need to understand why that is. I need to understand, as I'm listening, what is it that Paul wants me to hear? And then once I think I've understood what he wants me to hear, then I can echo back and validate it. <sighs> Two years ago, I had probably the worst conflict I've ever had with my dad. I had decided it was time for them to move into assisted living. I just had decided. <laughs> and I went over to talk with them. And as we talked, it became rather apparent, rather quickly, that he didn't quite agree with my assessment. And as I shared, he became a little bit more obviously upset about things. Well, I just came back with more reasons, and he came back with reasons, I came back with reasons, and finally, we were just kind of erupted, and I said to him, and I just 100% disagree with you. And he said, and I 100% disagree with you. That had never happened. My dad and I, we don't have those kind of conversations. We just don't. We really largely get along, but it, not at that point. And I got quiet. My mom says, um, let's eat a little. <laughs> that was nice. We ate, said a couple of things, said goodbye, and for three days I was on pause. Three days. It took me three days to dial down my emotions and three days, to be honest with myself, and to recognize and to realize I violated my own principles while I was talking with my dad. I didn't stop to pause and listen to understand him. So three days later, I went back and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't do well the other day. I wasn't listening to understand you. I was just trying to get you to understand me. And that wasn't good, and that wasn't right, and I'm sorry. And I said, Dad, I'm going to sit down here, and I want you to tell me again. Just tell me your thoughts about the idea of assisted living. Where are you coming from? Let me listen to understand you. I did that. I echoed things back, and I validated his thoughts, and that brought healing to our relationship. I love teaching this to people. 
in whatever setting I have the opportunity to do so. A couple of months ago, I had a chance to teach this to six men, six men who are wanting to learn how to communicate well. <laughs> Amazing. It took an hour and a half to teach them, though. Three days later, one of the men emails me and says, Mark, before I learned pledge talk, I felt powerless. And I thought, I know that. I know that feeling. Because we don't know what to do. Most of us are afraid of conflict because we don't know what to do. We were never taught or trained how to sit down and have what I call a healthy conflict conversation rather than an argument. I'm passionate about helping us to learn how to have healthy conflict conversations. They're needed, but we need to do it in a healthy way. So he said, before, Mark, Mark, you're teaching, I never knew how to do this. I didn't know how to have a healthy conflict conversation. I felt powerless. He said, but Mark, after your training, I feel like I am now an empowered conflict navigator. I was like, whoa, I had never heard of that phrase, used that phrase or anything, but I loved it. He was already teaching his, a couple of his friends, his son. His son was already teaching it to his friends, little seven-year-old guy. I was amazed. He had become, seen himself as an empowered conflict navigator. This happened about three months ago. Catherine, I hadn't even met you, didn't even know about empowered senior, and I loved the phrase that he used. Because here's my heart and passion. It's to help empower you as well. To learn how to have the tough conversations that you face day in and day out. Oh, there's so much more I'd love to teach. Again, I need a little more time. But the good thing is, over here I have a book. You can buy the book. I also have, oh, can I borrow this just a minute, Sandy? Heaven. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just like that. A one-page infographic you can use, and there's a short form, just half that. It's a, like a, a little card, and I have my business card on the back of that is the six steps. Take all those, look at them, learn them, and then share this with your kids and grandkids because they're going to experience conflict in their life, and they're not going to know what to do either unless someone teaches them. Finally, you can also go to my website, PledgeTalk.com. There's some free videos on there, and uh, I'll be over there in the corner. L afterwards, love to talk with you if you want to know more. Thank you, and if you, if you ever want me to come and share and speak somewhere, come up and give me your card or your name. I'd love to do that, too. Thank you so much. Fantastic. You know, maybe we should do a serious workshop sometime. Maybe at PBS, we could do a workshop to really learn this and go in depth. Would, would any of you be interested in something like that, coming to a workshop at PBS? All right, I think that could be good, Mark. We'll plan that. OK. Any ahas, or was the head bobbing just to make him feel good? Is there ever a time, was there ever a time when you might have benefited from a pause? It's a wonder we're just not all just writhing on the floor, punching each other. That's what I was thinking when you were talking. I think we're doing pretty good. We don't often break out in fist fights. But I think that the emotional pain that we struggle with sometimes every day even at night when we're trying to sleep, about unresolved conflict with loved ones, it's very painful. And I signed up to be a downsizing coach and teach seminars, and I don't know how to help people deal with these things that sometimes seem unresolvable. And so let's have you both come up, take a chair, each of you grab a mic, and we're gonna ask some questions. And you said you thought you had an aha. Uh -huh. Well, I just got a lot out of what he was saying and uh, really truly believe that listening is the key. 
you know, not interjecting your opinion, just dialing it down, listening, and then take the opportunity to get your point across. What's important about listening? If someone's listening to you, what do you appreciate about that? You feel validated, I think. Yes. Yeah, feel like you matter, feel like you're loved and cared for, and that they're crying. And they're not just listening so they can prepare their argument and thinking about what they're going to say next. They're not listening in their head to themselves, but they're really listening to understand. Awesome. Who else had an aha? Or had a thought about how can I use this in real life? I didn't realize there was somebody you could go to to help you figure out like what you do navigating. I mean, I, I just I personally don't have the, but I've been dealing with it with a friend who has tried figuring out what to do. And I, I just is not happy. And if we'd have known ahead of time that there was somebody could have helped through that process, it would have been so much better, I think. When and I, what I want to know is can you un that chosen a facility and you're not happy, can you undo that by talking, you know, and really figuring out if you're in the right place? Great question. So if you go to the wrong place and figure it out, do you have to stay there forever, Cameron? No. Most of them have a 30 days. It depends on what the contract is. Most of them have a 30-day notice. And so you're always able to give a 30-day notice and leave. Some, if it's independent living, some of them might be 60 days, So, but the majority is normally 30 days. And when I started my business helping people find assisted livings, my dad said, that's not a business. I've never heard of it before. And I was like, no, it, it is. You can do this. And he's like, if, if it was, I would have know about, I'd know about it. And um, so it's a very niche small group here in Wichita. Y'all are w one of the really, the few people doing this right now. Right, and we're and, the um, only nonprofit. Yeah. And we have a pledge mm -hmm. that we do things for the right reasons and we mm -hmm. bring in the right professionals because mm -hmm. oftentimes I would imagine it's an attorney or a financial planner mm -hmm. or someone that helps you with your health insurance and your Medicaid that helps navigate these things. Mm -hmm. And we can work together as a team because we're in and out of all of the places. Mm -hmm. We can be a resource to them and they're a resource back to us. But there's a niche business for everything. Mm -hmm. And the people that work with seniors have a heart for seniors, otherwise they wouldn't last mm -hmm. because it is so challenging. Um, so, and so, even if you had to give a 30-day or 60-day yeah. notice, it's not like you're locked in. You can't leave. You can leave anytime you, you want. Leave. It's kind of a negotiation. And so, a lot of people move. A yeah. lot of people do move. And a lot of people make the wrong choice first because they didn't know better. And when we moved everybody out of Kansas Masonic Home, it was so interesting because we got to learn so much. Dee, Bretta, Donette, we learned so much. Just that whole scenario of people making good choices and then sons and daughters not making good choices on behalf of vulnerable seniors. And then seniors not making good choices. And we did one intervention because of a very bad choice. And we were real happy that we had someone change her mind about where she was going to go. Mm -hmm. and there were a lot of them that we wished they would have changed their mind. And two of them had to move immediately. And we told them they weren't going to the right place. And so this is very much needed. Yeah. So if, if someone is in a place where they're not happy or it's not working well, then I would say contact your local agents. I think local is really important. Uh, like online, there's a place for mom and caring.com. Those are the national businesses that don't live here and don't know your community. I would contact a local person. They should do an intake with you to ask you what's important, what's working, what's not working, and then they can help give you, look at some other options. You don't know what you don't know until you're already in the middle of it, so it's, I find it really helpful to work with somebody that's doing it. When I help my parents in Texas, I made a bad choice, and I put my dad seriously in one of the worst. <laughs> it, it was an emergency. I put him in a wrong place. And he's like, you do this for a living? And I'm like, well, I don't live in Dallas. 
I don't know. So I called the, a local person there, and I said, I need help. I don't know Dallas. Tell me where to go. And so you can always contact them, even if you're in a place and you're thinking you need a change, and they'll walk you through the process. Did that answer your question? Okay. Who else has an aha or comment heading your way? And Bretta, you can, okay. All right, Mindy's got a question too. Great question. How, how do you find a placement agent if you're not here in this room? Because you guys are here, so now you know. You just call the phone number that's on everything, 686-4500, we can help you. Or contact any of the professionals that you're working with. They know what to do, and they care about people, and that's why they're here putting this program on for you. We also have connections in western Kansas. We have connections all over the country. You could probably help someone find an attorney anywhere. Yes? Sharice, you could help somebody with Medicaid anywhere. Anywhere. I can help you find a great realtor that works with seniors and loves seniors and is highly certified and matches our credentials anywhere. And I love to do it. Cameron, placement. You can help them find a placement agency anywhere. Yeah. I work with lots of, so I'm in Colorado, so all those Californians are moving in. Um, and so we work a lot with um, I, people in California, Florida, Texas, all different states. And so um, not every, since it's such a new industry, there's not people in every place, but I can usually narrow it down and find somebody um, depending on where you are. So I would say, here in Wichita, if you have a family member in another state or you're wanting somebody out of the Wichita area, I would call Catherine and they can connect you with somebody. Um, and we have a lot of national affiliations. And so that would be just like throwing it on us and then it's my responsibility to figure out some answers. And we're happy to take on that responsibility. And it, placement is such a new industry. It's so interesting because real estate has an example so regulated some of the laws came from Walt Disney he went up and was buying all the orange groves in Orlando and around and word got out if Walt Disney was going to buy your property you're going to cash in you're going to bank right so they had to make it a secret and have buyers agents and you didn't really know it was Walt Disney making an offer on your property real estate is very very regulated if you're working with a licensed real estate agent Placement is pretty new, but there's a lot of wonderful people like Cameron that are driving legislation and are driving ethics and standards of practice. And I think you touched on a little bit about family choice. Tell us what family choice means and why that's so important. So in Colorado, we're the only state in the nation where we passed a law that the online companies, like I told you, you could get locked into a contract with them and not know. We're the only state in the nation that can break that contract. And um, we helped pass, it's called the Family Choice Act because we felt like no one should own your name as a senior, that's your name. And you should choose who you work with. And so we pass a law where family has the choice to choose who they can work with. Mm -hmm. Did you ever watch Good Morning America years ago when Joan London was on? And she has been, I don't know if she is currently, but she has been the face of one of these companies She's not coming to your rescue, you know? You're not gonna call Joan, but you can call somebody like Cameron in any local area and get help. There's also attorneys, financial planners, social workers. There's lots of people that we work together in the aging field to help create solutions for people. All right, who else has an aha or question? This is fun, I love it when you guys participate. Okay, uh, Mark, I think that you've saved everyone in here probably two or three hundred dollars just uh, telling us this first uh, what you've told us thank you wow thank you thank you so much interestingly I actually interestingly had my son call me up uh, he is a history professor in uh, New York City he called me up one day and said dad I think uh, very similar he said you you actually you and mom has saved us two hundred fifty thousand dollars because you taught us social capital. 
those children. And all three of them went into their college and universities and PhD programs or whatever, and they got the top scholarships ever, saved them all the money. I was blown away by that. Awesome. But thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, thank you. Who here? Linda. I'd like to say that um, what I'm getting out of here, and I've only been in Derby, Kansas for two weeks, uh, and I've come from a big, well, Las Vegas, Nevada, where they don't care for your residents anymore. They just want you to come in, give your money, and leave. So <laughs> I'm here to start a new life, and I am glad to be here. But what I got is that instead of pledge talk or, or to get there and to get to a place that you want to be for your family instead of arguing and talking is put the word why mm -hmm. and, and write it down. Have your seniors or your family why. Why do you want this person to do this or go here mm -hmm. and why not? And then you can sit down and compare the notes without the, mm. um, the emotions, wow. the yelling, yeah. the screaming, the, um, all of it, that you don't get it to handle mm. if you just sit down and do a why and do it on there. I think it would help out better. And it, you can even do it with a friend or anything that you're mm. having a conflict is why do I like her? Why don't I like her? Mm. And what I've done this when I was married is, why did I want to walk out? Mm. 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 What's the benefit sure. of it? Sure. I stayed 53 years, so. <laughs> but it worked, and I found that writing this down and leaving it at his coffee cup in the morning, it gave him time to read it, go to work, and think about it, and then we come home and we talked about it. But I think the word why is very important in all of our relationships. I think that's great. I think it's important that we are able to think and process and try to understand mm -hmm. uh, even ourselves and each other. And, and one, so Mark, I want you to address that as the professional communicator here in the room, the counselor in the room. One thing I will tell you that I learned in some of my background is maybe instead of why, use the word what. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes why can put people on the defensive. Like, why do you think that? Mm -hmm. Rather, what has you th thinking that that might be a solution? Mm -hmm. What about such and such is interesting to you? What about staying in your home is so important as opposed to whatever? So, Mark, take it. I just think that's good. I think that's a, a, a very important uh, observation. It has to do with also things like open-ended questions versus closed-ended questions. And I think that the question that begins with the word what, um, again, it depends on how you say it. Cause you, and that's really critical because you can say, well, what do you think about this? Right, and you, and you see the facial expressions, the tone, and so forth, and that can put someone in a defensive position. But like when I was talking to my mom and dad, when I came back and realized what I had done wrong, I needed to say and say, help me to understand, and I used that phrase sometimes, help me understand your perspective. Where are you coming from? What is, what is in your mind uh, as you're thinking about the idea of assisted living? So it's, what the words we use and how we do it is, is so significant. That's beautiful. Help me understand. That would be a good pearl of wisdom to write down. Help me understand. Help me understand what's important to you about that. So the words we use really make a difference. So if we pause and listen and think things over a little bit, we have time to formulate our words because words are That's so great. powerful. That's so true. That's Does great. that yeah. answer some of your questions there, Linda? Okay, thank you for your remarks. I will head your way, and Mindy, go. So this is more of an observation for you, Mark. Um, part of what I do on the TV show for Ageless Enthusiasm is speaking to that go-to kid who is kind of sandwiched between the generations. And I just wanted to point out, I've said this before, but you brought up the generational differences. So most of us in the room were either raised by the silent generation 
or um, you know, we're baby boomers, we, or we have someone in that generation, we were brought up that it was impolite to discuss sex, politics, religion, and money. But if you look at what's in the news today, what are the headlines? It's sex, politics, religion, and money. So um, especially with the financial aspect and that component, can you maybe address how that would be an easier conversation from a child to a parent? From a child wondering? Or, yeah, like if you're trying to um, suggest to your parent that you they downsize, that they move, mm -hmm. that they um, go into independent living. I think, you know, it's difficult for some parents to have that conversation with their children about their finances or estate planning. So I think those four topics are really hot, and mm -hmm. you've got to approach them very carefully. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that's critical as what you just said, Mindy, the idea of, again, the word pledge in my mind has, has a, a lot of connotation to it. it and it's, um, I, I want to honor my parents, and, and I want to, to do well and do what is right. And so it's significant that I keep that in mind about how do I do it. And then I think a way to simply a, approach any topic is to kind of call out, in a sense, the elephant in the room, I, the idea, to simply say, I know this is a difficult topic. Um, and, and to kind of get that out there. It's a difficult for you, difficult for me, and yet I think it would be helpful to talk about it. But then again, look how I do this. I might do this like, I might do it like this. So I know this is a difficult topic, okay? And I care about you. And I think it might be really helpful for us to do this. And I would love to talk with you about it if you're open. Now, I'm just saying, uh, there's all kinds of things I could respond to, but I'm trying to say a couple things here, right? I could do it like this. I say, look, we need to talk about finances, and we need to do it now. Well, how's that going to go over? Not very well, right? Um, but if, if we learn to engage with other people in ways that are least threatening, and can show honor and respect and appreciation and love, again, just that is going to go a long way. And, and my doing it with my body posture, my doing it by slowing the conversation down, mm -hmm. and even putting pauses in between what I'm saying can be helpful to just kind of create a sense of relaxation and, and feeling a bit more safe. Excellent. And, and sometimes it's the go-to kids or the adult kids that don't want to have the conversation. And they'll say things like, oh, mom, I don't like to hear you talk about that. Oh, mom, I don't want you to move. I don't want you to give up. You know, and they'll be in anguish. Like they think their parents are planning to die because they're downsizing when that's not what it is at all. And so the kids can be very uncomfortable. And leveraging professionals to help because sometimes maybe you don't want to talk about some of these things but you know someone who could maybe the medical doctor maybe the attorney maybe the financial planner maybe some of these other people that you've made connections these connections are vital vital connections and resources for you um, I love what you said about the doctor Anything I can blame on the doctor, I do. If you're trying to take somebody's keys away, tell the doctor you want to talk about driving and say, I, I would let you drive, but the doctor said you can't. Or if someone's been pulled over by a police officer, that makes it even easier. Um, and then I love, like, I don't know if you noticed when Mark started talking, he leaned back and calmed down. I also, my dad was not open to talking about things because everything you're talking about is everything you don't want to talk about. Illness, money, death, independence, um, lots of blending of everybody's role. What I also found help is a steak, a glass of wine, and apple pie. And that's usually when we had our best conversations after, number one, I was showing my dad I cared about him. I made his favorite meal. And then the glass of wine helped take the edge off, and um, it helped. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's professional or not, but it works. <laughs> And pause, too. Pause and have some pie. 
Yeah, so it's a little it's strategy. Pause and pie. That should be in your yeah. show. Because sometimes the adult kids, their time frame is different. Because later in life, you might be go, go, senior, where you go, go, go. But there's sometimes when you're a little slow go, and you're not ready to be on the same pace that the adult kids are. What we got to get this done. We're going to call these people and call these people. We're going to check this off. We're going to clean out that closet. And it's a completely different time frame. And we have to kind of get on the same pace. And mirror and match. Like My if you want to calm it down, you maybe want to create some mirroring and matching. Can you? Yeah, yeah I, I, I think you do well, Kath. I was telling you the other day that I think you ought to speak more. And I have a heck of an ed education, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, think you do. I think you have a lot of great ideas. Yeah, and um, a lot of hard knocks. I was, was going to say, <laughs> my parents are still living independently. But I have a much better relationship with them right now because I realized what I was doing wrong, and I spent time and have continued to spend a lot more time listening mm -hmm. to them. You're minding your own business, son. That's what they like, right? Don't we want to be in charge of our own lives? Don't you tell me what to do? As my mother looks at me. <laughs> that leads in why I said it. I'm going to say what I say because I'm very stubborn and um, I did not listen and I probably would have died several times in my life. I'm now 69 years old. And if it wouldn't be for my family members, um, and I have one right here to my left, uh, she is a, a serious caregiver, and she cared for my mom, my dad, my sister Madeline, who had polio. And um, I wanted to get off being DPOA from her because I said, you've done it all, girl. Let me take, just take care of myself. You see how stubborn that was? That was not smart. And, she, and I want to say that uh, even when I had to go to assisted living by her request, I and the doctors, I uh, fought it. And I didn't bring anything to the table. I didn't bring TV, clothing. And I just, I was going to be in there two or three weeks. I ended up being there a month or more. And um, it's very difficult for someone who felt, I'm talking third person now, very difficult to give up what you felt you could do oh, for yourself. And now I am processing when I see programs like this, and it does bring me back hope. It does bring me back how important when you said, Cameron, about having a tribe around you, and um, I need to uh, practice that and be uh, faithful to that. Beautiful. Thank you for being part of the Empowered Senior Tribe. And it's so wonderful to see the, the love and connection in this room. Oh, and I love what you said. Is, and I can tell you're processing a lot of this. What I want, especially independent living and assisted living, a lot of times it's just that little extra support that's going to keep you independent. People think they're moving in and giving everything up, but maybe all you need is transportation and med minder, reminders. And so you can be more independent from your family and your kids or your power of attorney and be more of who you are because you have that support to make you successful. So it's, it's just a thought. It's, it's always your decision, your life, your money, but sometimes it's just the little tweaks that can keep you independent. Okay, so we have 90 minutes together every month to talk about really important topics. And, and I do the best I can coming up with a title and a description. And I know people really weigh in on whether they think that topic applies. Could you please share with people that no matter what the topic is, there's something to be learned by coming together and hearing from our peers and feeling like we're not alone and understanding what the resources are. Because mom said someone you gave a flyer to was here last month. She said she didn't need to come to this one because? Uh, she said they have already done all of that and she didn't feel she needed to. So, but I've learned a lot today 
and uh, there's something to be learned. Every every seminar is different, and I've learned something from each and every one. And even if you think the topic is something that we've done before, it's never the same because the experts are different. The conversation is different. The questions and the ahas and the remarks are different. And so I, I really, my hope is that you do find hope here and joy and fun and that this enriches your life and that you feel that this is your tribe and that you belong. And that's part of the reason for the binder so you can find this stuff later, but also that you know that you belong here. And it's about time, it's really time to wrap up, but you have Aging Parent Tribe dash Denver on Facebook, which is how I found you, I think. Yeah. Or it's one of the ways that really caught my attention. Tell us what Aging Parent Tribe is. And I'm assuming no one lives in Denver, but guess what? You could still be part of the Aging Parent Tribe. And it's one of the best groups that I've found where people are kind of crowdsourcing, is what we call it in social media, where you are putting questions out there or feelings out there, mm -hmm. tips out there, and people are chiming in. Tell us a little bit about what Aging Parent Tribe is. So I created a Facebook group called Aging Parent Tribe. You, you have to enter in your name and your email to be accepted because I am very specific about, I don't want scammers in there. I don't want people trying, you know, I, I protect the group. And so I want to make sure you're a real person and not somebody that lives in another tr country trying to steal identities or something. So I'm very careful about who I let in. But it is a group that does everything. There's about 2,500 people in it. Um, and that you can get any answer to your question there from other caregivers that are doing the same thing. If you need to figure out how to get somebody to shower, if you are having, if somebody is having incontinence issues and you need to find the best depends, we gotcha. I'm like, in fact, sometimes I'm like, these are my people because everybody has incontinence issues because it's such a hard thing to figure out and, how, and to solve. Or if you need a good chicken soup recipe, um, and so you can put questions on there and then other caregivers will respond from their experience. I also have some professionals in the group too that can um, help point you or um, give you expert advice for different topics. And, um, and just a sweet community. One of the men in the group, his wife had Alzheimer's and she just passed away. And it was kind of, he was so isolated at home he never got to leave a lot because she was, she was difficult to take out in the community. And so he was on there all the time posting articles or making suggestions. When his wife passed away, I had eight people text me within five minutes. Did you know that Donna passed? And um, a big group of us went to her celebration of life because it, it's education, it's community, and, um, and then it's also um, a, just a place to encourage you. Okay, very good. All right, any other comment, remark, aha from anyone? And then Delno will get a picture of the panel and then you can go and ask questions of anyone here. Well, I wish that I had had you guys a number of years ago when we had an aging relative that fell in her apartment, broke a bone, ended up in rehab, was not coping well, wanted to go back to her apartment. The conversation you were talking about did not go well because we told her she couldn't. She got angry, got up when they told her not to, fell and broke more bones. And then the next day, after we got her in the hospital and you know, we went back to her place at the uh, rehab. We were given a list, just handed to us, and said, here's 50 places that you can go check out to move her into, and you have three days to do it. And we did not have you guys for resources. And we spent four or five days getting turned down or walking in someplace and having the urine smell so bad we just walked out. It was terrible. 
So you guys do a great service, great service. And I really appreciate it. And I like coming to the lectures. Thank you very much. And it is true, sometimes it'll be, mom's gonna be homeless by Monday. We have to find a place and there's deadlines. Or the state will step in and say, you can't go home. And so you have to pick out a rehab. And so that's something that professionals can help you figure out which rehab place to go. Because the hospital oftentimes will tell you that you have to go to this place. We helped a family where a lady was happily living in senior living when she had a bone break, went to the hospital, everything was great. She and her son were hanging out and laughing and everything was great. And it was time for her to go to rehab and the hospital said, there's no bed for you anywhere. We'll let you know when there. So she stayed in the hospital longer, which you can get sick in the hospital if you stay there longer than you need to be, right? She did fine. But the, until the hospital said, oh, we have a rehab bed for you. Happens to be rehab bed they own. Okay. And it wouldn't be the place that we would want to send one of our relatives. But they led her to believe, led the son to believe that was the only place. And she died a few days later. They didn't let the son come visit. And he was given a call and said, your mother's dying. He's like, what? We were just laughing and joking. This is life or death. And that's what makes these conversations so important to start having them right now and start looking for these resources right now. So, did were you gonna say something with someone over here? Okay, all right, well, I think that's a wrap. So next month, we're going to talk about um, the nest egg talk. And I think the universal fear is that we're gonna run out of money. And some people are gonna run out of money, so we know what to do to help make things better and strategize because people can make a lot of bad decisions and they'll say, I guess the state will just take care of me. Well, I don't think you're gonna like how the state takes care of you. So let us strategize and help you get to a better place